inside America's boardrooms. The informational show for board members and corporate secretaries. Brought to you with knowledge partners, NASDAQ, the Center for Audit Quality, and PwC. Along with content contributors, Equilar, Meridian Compensation Partners, Wilson Sonsini Goodridge and Rosati, R.R. Donnelly, and the Society of Corporate Secretaries and Governance Professionals. Welcome to this edition of Inside America's Boardrooms. My name is Ty Francis, and I'm the Executive Vice President and Group Publisher at the Ethisphere Institute. And it's a pleasure to be back here at the NASDAQ market site in Times Square, New York City today. Now, you can typically predict that if I'm sitting in this guest host seat, it means that TK has moved over to the other guest seat. And uh, knowing TK, he's probably got something on his mind. So, without further ado, and to announce my first guest, my only guest today, is the host of Amer Inside America's Boardrooms, TK Kerstetter. Hey, TK. Well, Ty, um, this is starting to be a habit, and I'm more than happy to have you back. It gives me the opportunity to move, and we got a lot of great feedback when you were the host last time. So, here you are again. Oh, flattery is everything. So, tell me, what's new since I last hosted? Well, probably the newest thing is that uh, we recently launched a new show, sort of a sister show to uh, Inside America's Boardrooms called the Investors Board Performance Review. And what this does is it takes a look at um, institu large institutional investors and proxy advisors that have a lot of influence as far as their voting goes, and it basically asks them three questions. What do you think boards are doing well? What do you think boards need to improve on, which takes up most of the time? <laughs> and then what do they see in the boardroom in the future? So it's a great show. For our launch show, we had um, Mike Garland from the New York City Controller and the pension, New York City Pension Funds, Sean Quinn from the ISS, and Ken Birch, who heads the Institute, um, Council for Institutional Investors. So. I, if people get the chance, I think they'll really enjoy what those people had to say. So, I see the title of this show as the secret skill set that all great boards possess. Now, I know you pretty well, so this conversation could go anywhere. Um, so, let's get to it, and tell me what you think is this secret sauce. Well, um, what I'm going to talk about today is two things. I'm going to talk about um, tone at the top, and balancing major constituencies. But the most important part of this is that I'm asking the board, the skill set is to be able to step away from the hustle and bustle that occurs in the, um, even in the boardroom. If you're only meeting four times a year and you've got all those regulatory things to go over, it's a whirlwind when you're, when you're getting into those meetings. So, um, and tone in the top, Listen, in your business as Ethisphere, you must talk about tone at the top and how, what that means to culture all the time. Well, I mean, for us at Ethisphere, tone at the top is, is one of the benchmarks of what we do. Um, it sets a company's ethical agenda. I mean, the board, the CEO, and the chief compliance officer, they all play crucial roles in delivering this message. The problem is now, with reputational risk becoming as uh, widely regarded as important as uh, financial risk, Boards need to get on board with this. We had a CEO issue of our Ethisphere magazine um, a few months back, and US Bank CEO Richard Davis said that the market has transformed from a trust me environment to a prove it environment. So boards need to prove what they're doing. Well, there's no question that CEOs are the biggest influence on one's culture and, and establishing the tone at the top. They're the visible ones, they're the ones that are interacting all the day. But we shouldn't put aside the impact that boards can have on that. And not only boards may be hiring a new CEO, and they have to make sure that that CEO fits the, the character of the culture and all that's a real good fit. But more than that, they probably have three or four what I call watershed moments every year where they are going to make decisions that affect the culture of the organization. Let me give you some examples. Um, I'm, I'm not going to use companies' names. I'm not sure that that's appropriate. But back in a perfect example is back in 2005, there was a large retailer um, where one of their board members who had come up through the organization was very well liked, very 
popular, um, actually um, had an incident where they um, used gift cards incorrectly. And I mean, not just a couple gift cards. I mean, there was a big violation of that. Now, here you are, the board of this large retailer. You have one of your own that has just violated a, um, or committed a fraud. Um, I would say in the old days, that would be the kind of thing that you would try and sort of move around and get into a situation where um, you didn't have to let that person either prosecute that person or sometimes even let them off the board. Well, here's a case where if they would have done that, there was a million employees who would have seen that, okay, it's okay for a board member to commit this kind of thing. What kind of message does that send down the ranks? So the board actually prosecuted this um, individual. Uh, obviously, they, were, they left the board and, and uh, they were prosecuted and um, did, you know, was, were, was punished for uh, that particular crime. But that is what I call a watershed moment. There, the whole organization knew that if you, you know, do a fraud or you uh, aren't ethical, that uh, the board and management isn't afraid, regardless who you are in the organization, of taking action. And that is the type of thing that creates a culture. But that's interesting because I think the biggest problem companies have is you have this star salesperson and they can do no wrong. And other, com other company employees see that person, see them going off the rails and wonder, where's the punishment there? I want to come back to what you talked about earlier. I get turned at the top. I think we all get turned at the top. But what is balancing major constituencies? Well, remember, the core of this is to try and step away. And in the tone of the top, I'm asking people to step away and, s and make sure you're evaluating what kind of message your decisions are making, OK? Same is true with, uh, with balancing major constituency. When, when you look at major constituencies, I look at shareholders, employees, and customers. Now, there's other constituencies. There's vendors. There's the regulators. There's other people. But those are the three that, from a board perspective, I like to say, take a step back and see how you are in balance. And what I mean about, about balance, first of all, shareholders slash financials. So uh, when you're looking at shareholder slash financials, employees, and customers, in the perfect world, you want that to be in balance. For example, you don't want to reward shareholders, OK, in a major way that in some way would affect this being competitive with your salaries, OK? Because if you had that, and if you can imagine the balance, if you got out of balance where you weren't competitive with your salaries, what's that going to affect in the long term? Customer service. Sure. What will customer service, poor customer service affect in the long term? Financials and shareholder return, OK? So no matter what you would favor, if you spend a lot of money on customers, again, at the expense of the shareholders, that's not going to help your reputation in the capital markets. So all of these are sensitive to each other in the way that you need, you need balance. But day to day, as a board, you, it's, it's too much going on. So you've got to be able to step back and take a look at how uh, our organization is balanced and what kind of decisions are we making with employees, customer service, and with shareholders, and are we in balance? So it's one thing to buy into this as a favorable exercise, but it's another thing to actually find the time to do this or even get leadership to do it. How would you get around that? Well, first of all, I, I understand that some people that think this is soft, okay, that it's that I shouldn't spend my time on doing this. I happen to think the exact opposite because if I, if I can build the correct culture where people are making decisions, good decisions, without you know, major supervision, then, then I think you've accomplished a, a huge amount, both not only as a management but as a board. So I guess my point is you have to make sure you find the time, okay? You, whether it's a retreat, whether it's you carve out time at the, at the um, board meetings, there is a necessity to do this thought leadership in addition to all the stuff that goes on at the board meeting. 
So that's all the time we have for today. Thank you, TK, for giving me the opportunity to host another one of your shows. TK will be back in his seat next week um, on a new edition of Inside America's Boardrooms. So from me, Ty Francis, I'd like to say goodbye from America's Boardrooms at the NASDAQ Market Site in New York. We'll see you soon. Join us again next week for Inside America's Boardrooms. Brought to you with knowledge partners, NASDAQ, the Center for Audit Quality, and PwC, along with content contributors Equilar, Meridian Compensation Partners, Wilson Sonsini Goodridge and Rosati, R.R. Donnelly, and the Society of Corporate Secretaries and Governance Professionals.